Hi, I'm Lorenzo Moses, and I'm going to be talking about uh, synchronization in quantum systems. Um, the motivation for our research is Joseph's injunctions. A Joseph's injunction, which is shown here, is just a non-superconductor sandwich between two superconductors. Uh, our, the reason we're studying this is because we have a wide variety of applications, uh, such as producing qubits for quantum computers, which is the reason we're interested in the quantum behavior. Now, the equations describing a Joseph's injunction are equivalent to that of a pendulum. So to study Joseph's injunctions is equivalent to studying the dynamics of a pendulum. Now, I studied the simpler case of a rotor, which is a pendulum with no gravity. Although I'm interested in quantum behavior, I'll ease you into this by explaining the classical measure synchronization, which is very well understood. The equations for two coupled, non-linearly non coupled oscillators are given here. G is the coupling strength, which means uh, basically Think of this as the stiffness of the spring. If the spring is stiffer, then the movement of one pendulum affects the second pendulum more strongly. So higher G just means they're, they affect each other much more strongly, and lower means less strongly. I is the moment of inertia of the pendulum is, is resistance to motion. Measure synchronization is characterized by the angular momentum of each oscillator varying over the same range of values. I'll explain that in more detail in the next slide. The company strength at which the sudden transition to measure synchronization occurs is called the critical cup. Now these diagrams show what I mean. Uh, this, these first two are systems that are not synchronized, that are not measure synchronized, and these second two are measure synchronized. So for a system that's not measure synchronized, we get two uh, distinct regions where the momentum stay. So you can see here the first roller they exhibit some periodic behavior in their angular momentum. This is angular momentum versus time. But although they do oscillate a little, they oscillate in their own independent regions. They never overlap, they never cross, they never intersect. Uh, if you increase the coupling strength for an unsynchronized system, you increase it so that it's still not synchronized, but it's larger, you get a larger amplitude in oscillations, but they still don't cross over or anything. But once you increase the coupling strength, past critical coupling, they go from not overlapping at all to complete overlap. As you can see, in this case, they both vary completely between negative one and one. So the angular momentums of both oscillators are occupying the same range of values. Now one thing you'll notice is that for the unsynchronized rotors, if you increase the critical coupling, the frequency of oscillation decreases. For the synchronized rotor, um, once you're above that critical coupling, Increasing the coupling more causes the frequency of oscillations to increase. Now, of course, I want to study the quantum behavior. So um, what we did was we took a Hamiltonian for a system of nonlinearly coupled rotors. Um, we used the Schrodinger equation. This is the initial wave function we started with. Basically, both of our rotors are Gaussian packets. So we chose the standard deviation, uh, initial momentum, and an initial angle. We saw the Schrodinger equation and plotted the expectation value of angular momentum with respect to time to search for uh, the signs of measure synchronization. Okay, so for the quantum approach to measure synchronization, we can see a few stark differences. Now, if you look at the lower values of the critical coupling, it looks actually very similar to the classical synchronization. We have two each rotor oscillating in their own regions. And they don't seem to be overlapping, but one thing you may notice is that this top oscillator, the momentum, seems to have a downward trend, and for this one, it seems to have an upward trend. And our simulations seem to indicate that if you run them long enough, they eventually will cross, uh, regardless of how long the coupling gets, as long as it's not zero. And as a matter of fact, they will occupy the same overall range of expectation values, it's just that it takes a lot longer. For higher companies, you can see that this behavior is, it, it occurs much faster. Here we notice that they, um, the two angular momentum curves do intersect, but only slightly, and then they go away from each other. That's drastically different from the classical case, where they either overlap completely or not at all. We can see this behavior more clearly for the higher values. Um, as you can see here, they overlap slightly, they overlap a little bit more here. And we can see this behavior here, too. And that's because, of course, this top graph has a downward trend, and the bottom graph has an upward trend. Now for um, this graph, just shows what happens if you continue to increase the coupling. Um, and just as in the classical case, you can see that they, um, they occupy the overall same regions, except you notice that this time scale is different. By going only out to 250, 
the uh, graph that started off with the negative two uh, expectation value angular momentum has already went almost all the way up to the initial value of the second oscillator. I'm sorry, actually it starts at negative one. It just drops down to negative two. Uh, but they almost occupy the same region much more quickly. Now back to the smaller, uh, I'm showing you the smaller values of coupling just to show another important characteristic of these oscillators. Now if you look at this, you see that this has many small oscillations, but it also has a long-term trend, which is what we're interested in. This long-term trend is what will, over time, be a periodic function which will eventually intersect the bottom curve. But if you look at this time scale, even graphed all the way out to 6,000, this hasn't even over, uh, this hasn't even gone over a full period yet. So for very small values of coupling, it seems that it has a very small frequency. We a little more than double the frequency, and the uh, frequency, I'm sorry, a little more than double the coupling, and the frequency increased dramatically. This is going up to 8,000, and it's completed several periods by the time we reach 6,000, as opposed to not even completing one. And then we see the same behavior with these two. The graphs look the same, but the time scales are drastically different. This actually goes up to 2,500. We saw that it completed that many oscillations. And then at 25, we see the same thing, the frequency continues to increase. This is further indication that the systems are already measure synchronized for low values of coupling. Because as I explained earlier, it's only once you're already measure synchronized that increase in the critical coupling will cause an increase in the frequency of oscillation. So uh, in summary, it would seem as if quantum systems always exhibit the properties of measure synchronization as opposed to being uh, either not measure synchronized reaching a certain value, then drastically changing its phase. It seems to always be measure synchronized, but you see sort of degrees of differences. Like some graphs would take a lot longer to, to fill the entire range of angular momentum. Um, now we believe that this could possibly account, be accounted for by the uncertainty principle. These graphs right here show classical rotors. Um, now classical rotors in an unsynchronized system we have, uh, this is the phase diagram. So this is any momentum graph with respect to position instead of with respect to time. And we see that we get two bands for our uh, phase phase diagrams. And it's for an unsynchronized system. And then for a synchronized system, instead of getting two distinct bands with sharp boundaries and lots of white space in between, we sort of get the bands sort of bleed into each other. It's one gigantic mesh. Um, so, and this is for a synchronized system. Now for a quantum system, we would expect to ever get sharp edges because the uncertainty principle doesn't allow us to have a sharply defined momentum and position curves. So we would expect it to always bleed out to at least to some extent. Uh, so in other words, we would expect the systems to always be measured synchronized to some extent. It's, so instead of being a drastic difference between not measure synchronized and measure synchronized, we expect it to always be measure synchronized, but to a lesser or larger extent. So that would be consistent with our results. Our next steps would be to add gravity, uh, driving, and damping, and look for other forms of synchronization, such as phase synchronization, in which the oscillators will always be in the same position, or frequency synchronization, in which the oscillators will always have the same momentum at any given time. Um, I would like to acknowledge the Ohio Wesleyan University, University of Akron, Alma College, and the National Science Foundation. Thank you. Any questions for this speaker? So I'm slightly confused by the last statement on the uncertainty principle. So. Typically, in a phase space, when you account for this uncertainty principle, you just basically sort of discretize discre the phase space in such a way that the quantum mechanical phase space has a, some sort of a granular structure, right? Just like a blocks rather than have a point. Now, um, I mean, it's different from, say, your wave function, which is the entire reason it's it's this is slightly different so so can you actually go back to the uh, last slide there so I'm does the synchronization happens when these two paths or the bands are close together or it doesn't matter uh, well what happens it, it goes from 
they can get, uh, I believe they can be closer together, but what marks the difference is that there's no well-defined distinction. There's no like boundary here where this one ends and then go down a bit and this one begins. It's sort of one large area, such as here. If we don't have this, we don't have an unsynchronized system. Uh -huh. So what exactly was your question? I'm just kind of wondering why is it related to uncertainty? Well, we're actually not exactly sure why we get these drastic differences. That is one of the suggestions we came up with. Because we we wouldn't ever expect to have something like this for a classical system. Um, that may be something we investigate later. We may look for the, uh, the phase diagrams for the quantum case and see what kind of behavior they exhibit. But since we don't expect this, then we do expect it to have some, well, many differences in the classical case. Questions? Well, I mean, I have another question. It's sure. a bit technical, probably. So that you solve the Schrodinger equation by giving an initial wave functions and just, just run the Runge cutter in the yeah. range. Now, how did you numerically calculate the expectation values? Well, um, okay, well, we start out with two matrices that were the initial, um, you know, wave packets. We took the Fourier transform and put them in momentum space, multiplied the two together, and we get a gigantic square matrix. And we can actually use the, um, it wouldn't be something I can like, explain in like a few seconds, but you can actually, uh, if you were to write out the equation for the expectation values, you get like a summation. So we've just used a nested four loops and just run through the summation over and over until we get the expectation value. Okay. And you don't have any convergence issues or anything like that there? Well, we had a lot. Some of the issues we had, like for example, if our time step wasn't uh, large enough or if the matrices were too big, it took a really long time. So I mean, we did face a bit of it, a fair amount of issues, but we did manage to resolve them. Thanks.